morning, every Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Friend. My name is David Caprio, and I'm the CEO here at Children's Friend. It's great to have you all here with us on this not rainy day right now. So in partnership with the Right from the Start campaign, we are thrilled to have our 2022 gubernatorial candidates here with us today to talk about early childhood issues. Thank you to all the candidates for taking time out of your very hectic schedules um, to share with us your thoughts on the future of our kids and what you will do for our kids. While not all candidates are here today, all were invited. Governor McKee was scheduled to be, join us, but as you probably heard on the news, he is positive for COVID, and while he quarantines, and we send him our best wishes, he has taped a closing statement um, that we will run at the end with all the other closing statements from the candidates. I want to thank Leanne Barrett from Rhode Island Kids Count and Lisa Hildenbrand from Rhode Island Association for the Education of Young Children for their incredible partnership and support of the event today. I also want to thank the coordinators for today, Rachel Flum, Shannon Turner, and Adam Ramsey, along with the entire incredible staff of Children's Friend for putting this all together for us. We are thrilled to have several elected officials with us in person um, and virtually, including Rep. June Speakman, Rep. Marianne Shalkar smith who's not only a rep, but she is a legend in early childhood, uh, Senator Cano, um, and Mayor uh, Maria Rivera from Central Falls. I also want to thank the Board of Children's Friend for all of your support of our advocacy work at Children's Friend and making sure that issues impacting our kids come to the forefront of policy decisions in Rhode Island. And we are thrilled and honored to have all of you with us today. Whether you're in person or whether you're joining us virtually, thank you for working in, for supporting, and for caring about issues impacting our kids. Now I understand some in the audience may have strong positive or negative feelings towards some candidates, and that is great, and I ask that you keep those strong feelings to yourself. During the forum today, here at our Friendship Center, which is a four out of five star, uh, Bright Star rated uh, facility, we are very proud of that, high quality. I ask that the audience, we in the audience, follow the lead of our kids with two pretty basic but pretty important preschool rules. Quiet voices, listening ears. <laughs> Quiet voices, listening ears. Now, of course, those of you who are streaming it or at home watching it on Facebook, you can hoot, clap, and holler as much as you want. So to set the stage for why we are here today, I would like to invite the children from our Friendship Center to come up on stage and join the candidates.
Thank you to the kids and staff at Friendship. Thank you very much. That is why we are here today. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our partner, Lisa Hildenbrand, to say a few words. Lisa, come on up. Thanks, David. Um, that was amazing. Of course, I have to go after that. <laughs> I definitely want to thank the children, but I especially want to thank their teachers, and I want them to know that there is a whole group of us, everybody who's sitting here today, hopefully everyone who's sitting here today, who's fighting for them to get all of the support that they need. They have an incredibly difficult job, and we need to make sure we continue to support them and to make sure that we compensate them for the work that they do. So thank you, teachers. As David said, my name is Lisa Hildebrand. I'm the uh, executive director at Rhode Island Association for the Education of Young Children. And I am a member of the steering committee of the Right from the Start campaign. The Right from the Start campaign is a legislative and budget campaign led by eight organizations to advance equitable state policies for babies, young children, and families across the state. While we've made significant progress just recently, especially this last year, more policy reform and investments are needed to ensure that all young children, regardless of race, ethnicity, family income, or zip code, get off to the right start in life. Right from the start focuses on several policy areas. We have provided the candidates our advocacy agenda for this year, and um, we are focusing on investing for the state to invest in childcare, our early educator workforce, Pre-K, Rhode Island Pre-K and Head Start, paid family leave, temporary caregivers insurance, early intervention and preschool special education, the First Connections program, maternal and child health and mental wellness, and increasing revenue for the state. That's a lot. It's very, um, it's a very aggressive agenda, but we are fighting hard every single day to get these supports for our families and young children. I just want to recognize our steering committee members. Several of them are here with us today. Um, Beautiful Beginnings Child Care Center, the Economic Progress Institute, the Latino Policy Institute, Parents Leading for Educational Equity, Rhode Island Association for Infant Mental Health, Rhode Island Association for the Education of Young Children, the Rhode Island Head Start Association, and Rhode Island Kids Count. So thank you all for joining us today, and I'm gonna pass it back over to David. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. So we are lucky today to have Doreen Scanlon from ABC6 with us to moderate today's event. So Doreen is obviously a news anchor, well-known news anchor. She's a huge community supporter for many organizations in Rhode Island. She's a mom, and she's our friend here at Children's Friend. So please welcome Doreen Scanlon, and thanks to her in ABC6. Thanks so much, David. Thank you all so much. And let's give one more round of applause for those kids, because I'm not going to let you cheer another time. So get it all out. They are so amazing, and when you see their little faces, that reminds us all why we are here today. I want to thank Right From The Start Campaign and Children's Friend for having me here at ABC6 to moderate this Early Childhood Policy Forum today. And I want to welcome everybody who's watching us at home and everybody who's here in person. There really are so many people that care so deeply about Rhode Island's children, and it's great to see everybody coming out today to support us. 
As a mom of two, as David said, these are issues that are really important to me, and they really matter for all of us. The cliche goes, the children are our future, but we all know that that's absolutely 100% true. So we're gonna get things started, but first we have to go over ground rules. This is a forum. Uh, so I'll introduce the candidates and then we'll get things rolling. But first, our rules. Okay, so here's where we're gonna keep things rolling fairly. All candidates for Rhode Island governor who passed the state's eligibility requirements and will be listed on a primary ballot in September were invited to attend. Our candidates, as you can see, are, list are seated in alphabetical order. There will be no opening statements. All confirmed candidates were provided with the questions in advance today. I will ask each question. There will be five, and the order of questions has been randomly selected. The candidates will be asked the same question, and they'll each have the same amount of time, just two minutes to answer. The order of responders has been selected from a hat, and that will be read ahead of time. The time limits on responses will be strictly observed. There's a little clock here. Uh, so we also have a timekeeper who is going to give a yellow card when the candidate has 30 seconds left, and then a red card when the time is up. When that stop card is shown, the speaker must end their speech within 10 seconds. I'm gonna need to borrow those cards for when I go home and have to deal with my two kids a little later. <laughs> the audience may not applaud or in other ways demonstrate support or non-support for a candidate. If needed, I may restate the question, but I will not be asking you follow-up questions today. The candidates will not interrupt one another. Isn't it funny how the preschool rules apply? <laughs> in so many ways, candidates should refrain from personal attacks or charges, and answers should remain focused on relevant policy topics. After all the questions have been answered by all of our candidates here today, each candidate will have two minutes to share a closing statement. The candidate's closing statement should be significantly related to the matters discussed previously. So there we go. Now, to introduce our candidates in alphabetical order, we have Matt Brown, a Democrat, Helena Bonanno Folks, a Democrat, Nellie Gorbea, our current Secretary of State, a Democrat, Ashley Kalis, a Republican, and good thing I'm about to say your name as your I name got it. flies away, I caught it. Daniel Munoz, a Democrat. Thank you. I want to thank you all. Again, you all have such busy schedules. I've seen you out campaigning just about everywhere across our state. And we appreciate you taking the time to be here today. And of course, Governor Dan McKee did uh, plan to be here, but isn't able to join us today as he's in quarantine because of COVID. We do have that video of his closing remarks, and we'll show that at the end of the program. And of course, we hope he's doing okay and wish him a speedy recovery. All right, so our first question, let's sit down and we'll kind of make this a little more cozy here. Fireside chat, right? Uh, so it, our first question today is about the Head Start and Pre-K. The order of our respondents will be Ms. Kalis, Mr. Brown, Ms. Gorbea, Mr. Munoz, and Ms. Folks. So here's our question. Without additional federal and or state investments, Rhode Island will lose 800 pre-K seats in 2023. And state funding for Head Start that was cut in 2008 and eliminated 300 Head Start seats has never been restored. Given that the state has passed legislation calling for a plan to double the number of pre-K slots by 2028, and develop a plan to provide universal pre-K to all three and four year olds. How do you suggest we fund Head Start and the Rhode Island pre-K expansion while also maintaining top in the nation quality standards in a diverse delivery system that includes childcare, public schools, and Head Start? We'll start with you, Ms. Caleb. Sure. So we have federal funding, so what we need to start to do is stabilize the program right now with federal funding, but then we need to uh, include pre-K in general revenue and in budgeting year after year. Um, we can no longer have medium term or short term solutions to funding but really budget it as part of the education system and do it in a way that is structural. So what I would suggest doing is not going to bonds or things that will only last for 10 years but doing, um, doing budgeting in a way that is generational. And what that will look like is including pre-K in the funding formula uh, modification because I believe pre-K is part of education funding. It should be and if we rework the funding formula so that it is more equitable and fair and we are leveling the playing field we will be doing that early with with pre-K. So I believe the best way to fund pre-K is in the normal budgeting process so that for the next generation, pre-K becomes a systemic part of the education system. That's it. Wow, one minute. That was impressive. What yeah, I can be brief. Today. Okay, thank you very much. 
Next up, Mr. Brown. So I think the root of the problem is that uh, the people running things gave a massive tax cut to the richest 1%. That's people just making over $450,000 a year. That tax cut cost our state $1 billion over the last 15 years. While they left our children without quality education, our school buildings crumbling, programs like Head Start, other, other early childhood programs shrinking. And it also left us in a situation where those richest people, the, the top 1%, pay, the low, pay a lower share of their income in state and local taxes than anyone else in the state. A lower share than working people, lower share than middle class people. So as governor, I will increase taxes on the richest 1%. And we will fund our schools, we'll raise starting teacher salaries, we'll make our class sizes smaller, we'll fund universal pre-K and Head Start. Uh, I will also, uh, we will also enact a, a referendum for a constitutional amendment to make quality education a right in this state the way it is a right in Massachusetts, which gives parents the right to sue a school if their child isn't getting the education that they deserve. This is something I've been advocating for this constitutional amendment since, uh, since 2019, and it's something we need to do here. Thank you. Secretary Gorbea. Yes, good morning, everyone. It is so fun to be here today with so many people that I've worked with over the last three decades to improve the quality of children and families' lives here in Rhode Island. Um, you know, this is one of those classic cases with Head Start and Pre-K where we know that it works. We've known that it works for decades now. What's absent is leadership in the governor's office that will implement legislation and appropriate funding in a way that gets it done. And so that is what I aim to do as your governor. Um, we, if we can find money to do things like a soccer stadium or save buildings, we can absolutely take care of our kids and our families. We can make that happen. What's wonderful about Head Start and pre-K programs is that it comes in at a time in kids' lives and parents' lives where it becomes a lifeline. And I say that as someone who had the fortune of having a, a home daycare raise, help me raise my kids, right? That became my extended family, just like I know because I've been to the Head Starts the children family operates, and I've seen the parents and the kids. This, these become lifelines. This is not optional. This is not a frivolous investment. This is a absolutely essential investment to make sure that those kids and those parents can be part of our community in a meaningful way. I am looking forward to, as your governor, fully funding Head Start, making sure that we can recruit talented people into that field by paying livable wages, and also making sure that our kids are protected and are able to grow. Thanks. Dr. Munoz. Just want to thank Alex again for this amazing piece of art and um, share a little bit of brief history about my background. I grew up in, in Central Falls, Rhode Island. I think I'm the only person on the states to actually attend a Head Start program uh, and go through a public school system that was under resourced. Uh, I think it's important that we acknowledge that this is a racial justice issue. Uh, in terms of funding, there are mechanisms to fund it. Uh, you know, we, you know we, we certainly know that Head Start's a federally funded program. We have braided funding, right, where state is combining funding to try to get people to essentially be enrolled in both pre-K and, and Head Start. I think Head Start is the actual model that we should be talking about when we say expanding pre-K. We need to treat students holistically. We need to care for them holistically. We need to address the fact that many of them are coming from households where their parents can't afford to live. So how do we deal with this problem, both in terms of expanding pre-K to make it universal, increasing the rates uh, or the, the seats available for Head Start? Well, it's acknowledging the problem. And so the problem is that uh, pre-pandemic to now, we've had about 60% loss in early Head Start program. We have about a 12% reduction in the Head Start program now. People that are sitting in office, that have sat in office, don't acknowledge the problems because they have no incentive or motive to fix it. So the way that we fix it is, yes, we can use ARPA dollars, but again, we need to deal with the challenges holistically, which means, yes, taxing the rich, uh, but ensuring that the money is going to programs like comprehensive free community health systems to address parents that are overwhelmed, uh, ensuring that we have affordable and low-income and subsidized housing 
and expand those programs and their availability and ensure that within these Head Start programs, we're supporting the parents. Now, growing up poor and being where I am today, what I find is that there's a lot of coded language that, that's being told. You know, th those of us that know what it's like to live these circumstances are told that we should take certain positions. The only position in Rhode Island where we can affect this type of change is at the governor's office. That's why I'm running. And I'll just leave with these words of uh, John Gardner. Uh, John Gardner once said, uh, for every talent that poverty has stimulated, it has blighted a hundred. And we need to acknowledge that that's happening in this country and, and we can fix it. And it starts here. Thank you. Well, I just want to start by thanking all of you for gathering us. You know, we've been together, many of us, on the stage for a while now, and we've yet to have a conversation about our children. And this is the most important thing, I think, that we can do. I am a mother of four. My kids relied on daycare. Uh, I was a working mom, and it is incredibly stressful. And I had the means to be able to figure it out, but you know, we have far too many people in this state who worry so much about their kids. And I'm really grateful to all of you for the work you're doing day in and day out. So thank you for fighting for our kids. Uh, I have a plan, uh, and, and I think it's important to have a concrete plan, not just talk about issues from a holistic perspective, but put things in writing with detailed amounts. You can go to helenafolks.com and see that I've been advocating for just the kind of work that you're describing here from Head Start, universal pre-K, pre-K for three-year-olds. I think the difference is having a governor who doesn't just talk about things, but actually implements change. And if I have one real frustration with politicians and, and everyone who is serving, it's easy to talk. Talk is cheap. You all know that what we need is results. And you know, my career was in business. I spent 25 years rising through the ranks in an organization serving 200,000 people, uh, many of them women and, and who cared deeply about all these issues. So uh, I know how to get things done. I would, on top of using ARPA dollars, implement an education first budget. That would be the guiding principle for every budget I implement every year. Start with what our children need, what our education system needs, and everything else follows. And I think that's how we could produce real results for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is about early intervention. The order for this question will be Brown, Munoz, Folks, Gorbea, and Halas. As a result of years of inadequate funding, the First Connections Home Visiting Program for Newborns is in crisis. In the fall of 2021, most early intervention or EI providers in the state had to stop accepting new families due to very low staffing levels. Families with infants and toddlers at risk for and experiencing developmental delays were forced to go on a wait list for these EI services. In July, Rhode Island passed a 45% Medicaid rate increase for EI services and has also allocated over $10 million in ARPA federal funding to address the staffing crisis for EI. But there are over 650 infants and toddlers waiting for services that are required under the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. How would you candidates work to ensure that the EI waitlist is addressed in the long run to ensure that everyone who needs services is able to access them? We begin with you, Mr. Brown. It's absolutely essential that um, children who are at risk for or are experiencing developmental delays get access to these services and get access to them right away. Uh, my friend Michael Niemeyer experienced uh, these delays himself. Uh, he and his wife had a baby girl who was born with a rare brain disease. They had insurance, uh, uh, but the insurance blocked coverage, denied coverage for the genetic test that the baby needed. They denied coverage for a chair that would have helped the baby swallow. Uh, when a manufacturer of medicines that would have helped with this condition reached out to the family and offered them, the insurance company intervened and denied coverage for that also. Uh, so Michael and his family relied on early intervention in a, in, a, in, a, in a very fundamental way, as many families do. 
so let's talk about the underlying cause of the crisis in this program. The underlying cause of the crisis in the early intervention program is that the people in power drastically cut Medicaid funds in this state that led to severe staffing shortages and very, very long wait lists for these, for these young children. Um, many of us warned that these crises would be the result of those cuts. These were entirely predictable and they did it anyway. As governor, it would be a top priority of mine to reverse those Medicaid cuts, restore and expand the Medicaid funds so early programs like early intervention have the resources that they need and the children can get access to those resources. Thank you. Dr. Munoz. Yeah, thank you. Since Michael was brought up, I just want to say he's uh, running for Senate, uh, and I think it's important for people with lived experience to, to fight for these changes because it matters. Uh, and you know, when we think about early intervention program, and frankly, a lot of which I've learned from, uh, from those that are do in the fight, is uh, it starts at the federal level. You know, our congressional delegation and just Congress in general has not ever really um, gotten us to the initial promise when it comes to the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act, which is to fund or to essentially offer 40% of the cost, right, to the, to, to the states in terms of like um, the states covering 60%, they're covering 40. They're at a, they're, Congress is at about 15% now. So at the federal level, we're failing. Uh, when it comes down to what the state contributes, uh, you know, what we also know is, you know, it just isn't enough. Uh, legislators Geraldo and Alverdi have proposed legislation to get us up to about 70% um, with early intervention and about 122% in terms of increasing uh, rates uh, for the First Connections program. Now, why is the First Connections program vital? Uh, because we know uh, that we operate here in Rhode Island under a large hospital for-profit system. So like, you know, a lot of the care people are receiving, they're, they're navigating through the waters of a really congested and kind of like multi-layered um, administration. I think it's important that, to acknowledge that First Connections is the way that we get help to people at home. And that gets us to the, the big important point here, which is we need to move towards a single payer system in Rhode Island. That's about a 10 year process, but it starts with building infrastructure around community health care that's comprehensive and free and incorporating these programs into that structure to try to supplement additional funding on the state side um, through other services that we're providing. Uh, and, and I think that's how we can get creative and really expand the state funding. But we got to push on Congress, too. Thank you. Ms. Folks. Yeah, three, three things that are, I think are really critical here. First was we obviously need rate increases. Second, we need a massive outreach in terms of reaching uh, the parents who uh, need to know that these services are available. And I would be doing that from a multilingual perspective and reaching into every community. And third, we need a pipeline of care providers, a workforce development program that increases the number of people uh, who provide these services, especially people of color and bilingual people. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm guessing we have more areas of agreement on this stage than disagreement. I think the real differentiator that I would like you to think about when you're thinking about your next governor is not the what, but it's the how. How do we find a leader who actually can execute on these ideas? And that's what I know how to do. We have a, a gap today, as you said in your question, of 650 families in need. As governor, I would be pulling together everyone who works on this problem on a regular basis to hold them accountable, to see where the metrics are. I'm used to doing this in my career. I, I had uh, an experience when I was uh, at CVS running the retail business where every Friday morning I'd have a meeting on one particular problem and invite everyone in the country who was delivering bad metrics around this. And you didn't want to be invited to my meeting because you had to show up and explain what wasn't happening. What were you not doing? And I'd like to implement that in Rhode Island because I know that when we shine a bright light on the issues, we can solve them, we can solve gaps. It's not just about having the ideas and the programs, but it's actually about the leadership skills to hold people accountable and produce results. And that's what I've done my whole life and I can't think of anything better than doing it for our kids. Secretary Gorbea. 
Yeah, this is um, like all of these topics. It's about valuing the caregiving economy. Like there is an economy that takes care of people that's instrumental to the functioning of the rest of the economy. And the greatest benefit of it is that it improves the lives of children in, 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 our, in our Rhode Island state. So it starts with doing, having a governor that knows that that's part of the issue here. Um, I'm gonna work with those of you in the field, many of you who I know, uh, and we're gonna do this together. We're gonna allocate funding and pay reasonable wages and look at Medicaid and we're gonna do all these things. Um, and, and then, you know, just by those actions, word does start sp spreading, that this is now a valued part of our state, that we want people to address this. And that's how you tr attract people to the, to the sector. Now, that's the short term, but there's a long-term game plan here too. And we need to make sure that we have higher ed programming, that we've got other uh, supports to people choosing this field to make sure that they're gonna stay in it for the long run. And may, where maybe it's you know, uh, housing affordability because we have a real gap in housing affordability across the state. And so that's an added incentive. Uh, but, but we need to make all these connections between the silos to tackle something like this wait list. And it would be absolutely my joy to be able to work with every one of you here in fixing this problem, because it is absolutely doable. These are not like complicated issues in, 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 in the abstract. These are absolutely tangible, step by step. And having done it in elections and in business services and in other areas where you work with the legislature, the advocacy, nonprofit community, and with those in government, I know how to do it. We can get it done. Ms. Kalis. Yeah, so we have a tiered system in healthcare and early intervention. I'll tell you that um, I'm a working mom. I've always been a working mom. And at 16 months, I sent um, my son uh, to a high quality um, early education center. And the teacher pulled us aside and said, you know, I think you need to get something uh, looked at. We think something's not quite right. And there's that horror as a parent when you realize you would have never known unless you had somebody tell you. Because we were a first time parent. We didn't know what was normal and what wasn't. And so when we looked into getting a neuropsych exam, the wait was six months. And so what we decided to do, we couldn't afford it at the time, but we did it anyway. And we were able to, luckily. We paid to get our child taken care of, and there was an issue. And we struggled with it for a number of years. And my child had a 504, and we had a number of barriers with early intervention, including getting OT. And at that point, we decided instead of waiting for early intervention and missing more benchmarks, we would pay for OT ourselves. And that's not an option that everybody has. And it's completely in inequ inequitable and unfair. And even if you can pay for it, it's very difficult as a family. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to raise Medicaid rates to make sure that individuals can get um, can get care. We also need to develop the workforce so there are more providers. The long term, those are the long term structural things that we need to do. But in the short term, you cannot leave children behind because the whole purpose of early intervention is getting involved early and giving options for parents to get involved early. Now, I mean, we put it on our credit card. We did what we needed to do, but as someone who comes from a single mom, my mom would have not been able to have done that. The other thing we need to do in the interim is that we need to uh, make it so that it's easier for providers to come in, so that if we have the funding available now, we need to quickly build the workforce, which means we need to look at compact licensing to get providers from Massachusetts and Connecticut in to fill that gap so those children are not on lists. We need to look at creative solutions like telemedicine as well for services that are appropriate for those sort of things. So there is the long term, which is the structural funding issue, but also in the short term, we cannot continue to leave children behind because the whole purpose the purpose of early intervention is to get involved early and help parents realize there's a problem and then immediately help families. Thank you. Time now for our third question. It's going to be focused on paid leave. Our order will be Gorbea, Folks, Munoz, Kalis, and Brown. Paid leave. Rhode Island was a national leader by becoming the third state in the U.S. to establish a paid family leave program the Temporary Caregivers Insurance Program, known as TCI, which provides job security and wage replacement so that new parents can stay home to take care of a new baby or any worker can take care of a seriously ill family member. There are now 11 states that have paid family leave programs and Rhode Island's program continues to have the lowest wage replacement and shortage number, shortest number of weeks in the US. 
Would improving the temporary caregiver insurance program be a priority for your administration? And if so, what improvements would you fight for? We start with you, Madam Secretary. So absolutely, this would be uh, an, a priority for my administration because it falls under what I've been talking about, which is that when we pool our government resources, it should be about investing in people. And investing in people when they're having a, a, a real hard time managing an act, you know, a, a situation where they need temporary care insurance is absolutely critical. Um, this is good for people and it's good for business. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that when this was first being debated as a policy idea at the Women's Fund of Rhode Island, I was a part of that. I was a part of that organization. And it speaks to how I've worked with many of you in getting things done. Uh, I had a, a great debt of gratitude to Senator Gail Golden, who got this legislation through the General Assembly, and that we were able to implement. Now, we need to improve it. Like any good policy, you break it through, and then you have to evaluate it and see what else is missing. And that is what I know how to do. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. What are the odds that somebody who actually cares about public policy and, and, and actually studied public administration might actually have the skill sets to do this? Um, we need to make sure that our economy provides care at a moment where families need. And we need to make sure that we level the playing field, that it's not just a one type of family that has access to this, but all families have access to temporary care insurance at a rate that makes it affordable and lets them focus on what we know we would want to do if we were in that circumstance, right? Do unto others as you would like done to you. And that is to take care of your family and make sure that others have your back while you're going through this tough time. The best employers do that. The ones who don't are not so great. Let's make sure that our Rhode Island businesses are able to continue to function and that our employees are able to function and we take care of our families and kids at, in a time of need. Ms. Folks. Yes, absolutely. This is very personal for me. Uh, many of you may have heard me talk about this, but when my, I had four children very quickly and when my youngest was just one year old, I got thyroid cancer and had to take about four months off. And this was early in my career. It was an economic strain for me, but I remind myself every day how lucky I was because I had good health insurance, paid time off, and a very good boss. And this is what far too many people in this state are missing. So, you know, look next door. Both Connecticut and Massachusetts do provide 12 weeks of paid leave. We could absolutely do this when we put our minds to it. Um, but I don't think this is just about having a public policy background. I think this is about knowing how to attract, retain, and grow businesses in the state because one of the things that we're missing is an economic engine which can drive the resources to invest back in our social services. When I look at our neighboring states, what they have built is thriving economies and those thriving economies allow them to invest in their children. I think this is something that's been missing in Rhode Island. I think childcare and education is a huge part of how we can attract more businesses. As I was recruiting families all through the years at CVS, most of them ended up living in Massachusetts for one simple reason. Childcare and education was far superior to here in Rhode Island. So these two issues are connected and it's not just to sit enough to say you understand the public policy. I think you've got to be a person who's actually driving growth, driving the business climate so that we have the resources to invest in all these services, which are so critical for every family in Rhode Island. So I'd be, I'd be honored to be able to work on this on behalf of every family in this state. Dr. I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, I, I think that, it, it, again, it's important to acknowledge that in the same time period where we're talking about supporting individuals, we know that there are postpartum conditions uh, that may uh, contribute to individuals not necessarily being optimal to go back to work, uh, whether it's postpartum depression, whether there's a number of issues that might arise. So this isn't just a matter of like, you know, spending time with your child and, and supporting their development. Um, but this is also very important about the individual themselves and having the necessary time period to heal uh, and to come back and the family as a whole because I do believe that should be, you know, in terms of like it being um, for, for all parents. I'm going to use my extra time and I'm just going to talk about the system as a whole. 
Everybody talks about increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates, but let's talk about what needs to happen. You need the courage to get some people angry. We have you know, managed care organizations that are pretty much profiting. Uh, we have an entire healthcare system that's too expensive and no one's talking about where we can cut costs and where we can pull the money together to actually expand on some of the programs that are being discussed here. So this isn't just about who's the best manager, it isn't just about lived experience, it is, do you, it is about do you have the courage to completely and radically transform the healthcare system here in Rhode Island and all of the services that contribute to the health of our children and parents. Uh, so when I think about you know, paid family leave, like I'm also thinking about legislation that's being pushed, and it's not just about policy, it's about the fight that's being pushed by Representative Speakman and Representative Anastasia Williams you know, for ensuring that we're you know, expanding coverage for postpartum care for a year and, and making sure that that's never really challenged and taken off the books. So this is the fight. It's going to take a governor to work with those legislators that have had the courage to start the fight and then to take it to the corporations that continue to take money away from our kids and our people and to put it in their pockets. Thank you. Ms. Kaylin. Hey, it sounds like we're differentiating ourselves. So not only do I have a background in policy and in business, I'll actually give you an answer as to how to improve policies around paid leave. So yes, I support it. What we can do, um, with self-employed individuals, we need to have a program where they can pay in and also take advantage of paid leave. I will tell you that I uh, was self-employed and I never took maternity leave. I couldn't. I worked through labor, I worked the next day, I still had to keep my business going and there was no option for paid leave for me. I would have loved that time with my children. So we need to make it possible for self-employed individuals to take leave. The other thing is we need to expand who you can take leave for, for grandparents, for other members of your family, because the reality is that family structures are different. I am the only person in the world that my 88-year-old grandmother has. And that structure, whether it's a grandmother, whether it is a sibling, we need to make sure that caretakers can take care of their family members and expand what that actually means. And then we also need to look into expanding leave to a reasonable time, which could be 12 weeks, and, and also making it actually possible in terms of the amount of money that we give for leave. Because you can give money, but if you can't pay your bills or you can't make it, then you really can't take leave. Um, we need to be able to do that as well. Mr. Brown. Yes, we need to expand uh, paid family leave here. When I was uh, 21, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and I was in college at the time. I quit college and moved home to help take care of her. And she got treatment and it worked for a number of years and then, and then it didn't and then we lost her. I would like to believe I hope that the time that I was able to come home and be with her and help made some kind of difference, at least made it less frightening um, it, it, in those early stages of coming to terms with that diagnosis. Uh, a lot of people in our state just cannot take the time to care for their loved ones. They just can't afford to do it. Uh, Rhode Island's paid family leave program doesn't provide for enough time and it only covers 60% of people's paychecks. Working people just often can't afford to live on just 60% of their paycheck. They can barely afford to live on 100% of their paycheck. So as governor, uh, I will expand Rhode Island's paid family leave program to 16 weeks and ensure that it cover 100% of people's paychecks so that everyone can take the time if needed, to care for a sick child or a newborn child or another loved one. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than halfway through candidates getting there. Our fourth question is about child care. Our order will be Munoz, Kalis, Brown, Folks, and Gorbea. Well, the state used federal funding to make some significant investments in the Rhode Island Child Care Assistance Program this year, increasing the family income eligibility limit making low-income college students eligible, and increasing the reimbursement rates for child care providers, the state spends $47.5 million less in general revenue on child care than we did in 2005. Child care programs are still struggling to hire and retain child care teachers, and parents still struggle to afford quality child care. 
What would you candidates do to address these challenges for providers and parents? We'll begin with you, Doctor. Yes, absolutely, in terms of expanding rates. Um, also, I think it's important that we talk about like how expanding Rhode Island Promise to non-traditional students that may in fact not be able to enter Rhode Island Promise because they can only go part-time because they are working parents um, is going to increase the demand for the program, which is why it's essential to increase CCAP in terms of funding. I, I think the governor proposed uh, up to 200%. I agree more with the 250 percent that's um, that's that's been advocated for by right from the start. We have a supplemental wage program that you know it's hard to it's hard to say it's enough. Uh, you know you're supposed to make sixty eight thousand dollars a year. You're making forty seven thousand dollars a year, and then the supplemental wage program is giving you about seven hundred dollars extra every six months. So I, I don't really understand how we're going to attract more childcare workers to the state of Rhode Island when there's a labor advantage in Massachusetts. When, when we say supplemental wage, we're, we're really talking you know, anywhere between 1,600 to 1,800 per person. It's, it's very performative, it's very Rhode Island-like uh, to, to put it out there, all due respect. Uh, so how do, we, how do we address the problem um, in terms of increasing you know, pay? I, I think we just gotta go straight at it and say, it, is it important or not to have childcare workers that are helping our children during early development? A little personal example for me was we had uh, Juliet in daycare and when we started her in a daycare, uh, there were uh, people that were very experienced that had been teachers and, and are, were in the daycare, and we were really excited. And over time, we started to see every one of those individuals no longer be there. And then they would leave one by one. And we kept Julia in the daycare, and we saw them leave. And then it was only one person. And then one day, Julia came home, and she had this concept of, of, uh, of like fighting, which we don't teach her. I said, where did you learn that? She said, they had us watching Power Rangers. So my point is that there is a consequence to not adequately funding these positions. And as governor, I will certainly make it a point to ensure that we're fighting to provide the adequate funding to have more childcare workers, better pay, and better services for our children. Ms. Kalis. Yeah, um, as a mom of three boys, I have a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old. For the last decade, I've been living in the world of um, child care and every single day showing up and hoping that I'll have a provider or a place for my kids. Um, no matter how stable it is, you, they're just things happen, right? And um, there have been days where I've taken my uh, kids to work. And also, if you're going to be an employer that cares about employing women, you have to also let your employees do that. So I can say that a lot of times I've had um, kids in lobbies for the entire day because something's happened and that's okay. And um, also, as a kid with a mom who was divorced early and a business owner, I used to think over uh, Christmas vacation that I was helping her work. That's what she used to say. Um, and I would lick envelopes and do mailings for her. And I realize as an adult now, the reality is she just didn't have child care. And so that's what I was doing as I was sitting at work with my mom because she had no other options. Um, I also know with, um, I remember the experience with Ride. Um, when uh, in December, everybody was told to take their, uh, consider taking the laptops home for the kids. Well, again, being an employer that cares about making sure that we have flexible schedule for, for women and making it possible to participate in the labor force, um, that um, when I heard that, there was a moment of terror because I thought I would lose half of my workforce if the schools closed again. And I also wasn't really sure what we were gonna do with my kids. And we struggled through that through COVID as well. So in order to fix um, this problem, there are things that we can do. We need to make sure um, that we have universal pre-K. The other thing that we need to do is we need to pay based on enrollment versus based on attendance. You cannot run a child care business with that amount of variability. We also need to peg the cost uh, to real costs of running a center. Um, those things will help significantly in stabilizing um, child care. Also having networks so child care providers can take advantage of um, distributing purchasing and also for the administrative burden across different childhood providers. That would help stabilize the system as, as well as doing a professional development workforce development um, thanks all right thank you thank you mr. Brown there are two problems one is that parents are struggling to get by in this state they can't make ends meet and they can't pay these bills and the reason is that the costs of the basic things people need like housing and health care and child care have gone up hundreds of percent and wages have stayed essentially the same, which means it just doesn't add up for people. The second problem on the other side is that 
childcare workers can barely make ends meet. We've got a lot of people who would love to do this work that don't because it doesn't pay a wage that they can live on. And then we have people doing this work struggling to provide quality care because after work, after their shifts, they're driving an Uber or work in retail because the wages don't provide enough for them to live on. So to address both of these problems from the parent side and the child care worker side, as governor, I'll raise the state minimum wage to $19 an hour. This will do three things. One, this will put more money in the pockets of Rhode Island's working parents and help them make ends meet. Secondly, it will grow the number, increase the number of child care workers within our state, people who want to do this work and now will be able to do it because it pays a living wage. And third is it will attract new child care workers from Massachusetts and Connecticut to come here or come back here and do this work. In addition, as I mentioned before, we also will expand the paid family leave program to 16 weeks and make sure it covers 100% of people's paychecks so that family members can also provide care when that makes sense and is needed. Thank you. Ms. Phillips. Yeah, this is, this is a broken system, and this is one that, first and foremost, we have to put a lot of pressure on the federal government. You know, the average Rhode Island family spends 25% of their income on child care, and the average child care worker today is making less than he or she could make working at Dunkin' Donuts. So it is a system that does not work. Uh, the Build Back Better program would have capped child care at 7% of a family's income, what an opportunity we had as a federal government to make a lasting impact on our kids. In the meantime, we've got to do everything we can at state level until we get that, that to happen at the federal government. Uh, we need to invest in child care workers. We need to invest in modernizing facilities. Uh, we need to develop a fund so that if, I, if, if someone wanted to start a child care program, they have the resources to break through the barriers. But there's one thing really missing here too, and this is leadership from this governor. Today we have a broken system in our state. Look at DCYF. It is not working. We do not have a governor who's holding people accountable to results. I talk to so many of you who are sitting here who are working in the nonprofit sector, working every day for our child and our families, and you see what's broken and you know what's broken, and you need a leader in that spot who knows how to pull everyone together and make sure the resources are going to where we serve our children, and not just put excuses on the table, but really drive results, and that's what I will do as your governor. It's not okay just to talk about it. You've got to deliver for the people of Rhode Island, and I'm so committed to doing that. So child care is one of these amazing public policy opportunities where you solve a number of issues. When you invest in quality child care, you actually improve the, the lives of that child, the life of that child in child quality child care. You help them develop in a better way and be ready for school or be ready to be take, ready for school. You actually help that family be able to take care of itself by providing the opportunity to work and, and to have meaningful employment. And you can provide a livable wage, if you do it right, for the people that are providing these services. It's, it's an amazing opportunity for us to do investments. I disagree with the characterization that this is a broken system because I think that's a disservice to the people that are working in it right now. This is a system that has been neglected, where resources have not been applied, and that is what's missing. Leadership that will say, this is a valuable part of our state and of our economy, and we're gonna work together to make sure that we make those investments. I am grateful that my children were old enough that I didn't have to go through childcare issues during COVID. But now that we're easing our way out of it, this is a golden opportunity between federal funding and the attention that, and the realization of how important childcare is to the functioning of our state that we need to double down. And it is appalling that we have had somebody in the governor's seat that has not solved or even tackled any of these issues, where there's a contract with SEIU that takes care of home daycare providers, a huge part of our economy, and that hasn't been, it's been strung along, strung along uh, in, in a way of playing politics with the issue. 
We need to focus on what's real for families, and that is to make sure that childcare is valued, service as, as an employment, that we provide the resources to families. I remember when Republican Governor Carcieri changed the eligibility because my, uh, my kids were in a home daycare. We had kids drop out. We had kids whose lives were harmed by public policy. And as governor, I will make sure that we do the opposite and we invest in families and children in daycare. Thank you. All right, last question. You're almost there, guys. Uh, it's about child welfare. Folks, Gorbea, Caitlis, Brown, Munoz, that'll be our order. Our child welfare system has struggled for years with inadequate funding, high profile child abuse cases, even child fatalities, a lack of national accreditation, and inconsistent leadership. In fact, for the past three years, and for five of the last seven and a half years, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, or DCYF, has been led by an acting director. What actions will you take to stabilize and strengthen our child welfare system to help ensure the safety and well-being of children in Rhode Island? We'll begin with you, Ms. Bolt. I think this is part of the larger problem with Governor McKee, and that is we have a massive brain drain at the top of this state. He has lost so many talented people, and believe me, I, I'm sure some of you are out here. I've had conversations with you. You say to me, it is really hard to work for someone who doesn't listen and who surrounds himself with cronies who don't know about the topics. So we have to call it what it is. It's about leadership. It's about having the people in charge in these positions who are empowered to do what they need to do. Uh, you look at DCYF, I mentioned this before. How about SNAP benefits? We, had, uh, we were one of a handful of states in the whole country where we had fewer SNAP benefits during COVID. And it wasn't because people didn't need it. It's because the offices were closed and it took 90 minutes to wait on the phone to get access to those services. So this is about getting talent at the top and holding these people accountable. On DCYF, uh, you know, we, we, have a, we do have a broken system. It's not just about good people doing enough. We have a system that doesn't work. And even when we look at the recent actions the governor took, to fill some of the 90 open positions at DCYF, where did they come from? From the nonprofit organizations that were serving the children and the families. It didn't solve the problem. So you have to think holistically, act like a leader, hold your teams accountable, and deliver results. And that's what I will do as governor of this state. Secretary Gorbea. Look, this is an area, child welfare, that we absolutely need to tackle, and I look forward to doing that with many of the people in this room. We know what has to happen. What's, what, what we need to do is we need to bring the nonprofit sector together with the governmental sector. We have state employees, dedicated state employees, that, uh, that I want to thank because they're doing an amazing job under very trying conditions. They're understaffed. They haven't been resourced. They haven't been listened to. I know what that's like because I hear it uh, every day from people on the street. I will make sure that we have a government where the leadership listens to the people involved in these issues. And you're all going to provide the solutions. It's not some high priced consultant coming in and telling us what to do. It's all of us around this table. And we are going to make sure that those families in need are dealt with in a, in a not just in a caring way, but in a culturally competent way, that we're bringing in the variety and diversity of communities into the child welfare system so that we can, we can provide that kind of nurturing service. Um, we have a real crisis in our child welfare system. It's a lack of leadership that doesn't allow it to, to, to change and to transform at a very critical moment when we do have resources at the table. Look, processing SNAP benefits, not that different than processing other forms in government. Nobody's gone in there and said, okay, what are, what are we doing here? How can we make this easier on the user, which are families in need? How can we make it easier on the staff that has to process that? And then make that happen. I did it out of business services and other areas in my office in elections. I know how to change government to make it work for people. And that's what we need to do in the child welfare system and across state government in Rhode Island today. Ms. Kalis. Yeah, um, leadership matters, and what we see is a lack of leadership 
a lack of permanent leadership. Um, and in my administration, you will uh, have a leader of, in myself and in the person that I asked to help me transform um, this organization. Um, and somebody that will stick with it because there is transformation that needs to be done and you need to know that the person that's going to be with there with you is going to be there through the transformation. We need to pursue accreditation. Accreditation is, I've been through three cycles of accreditation with my high volume ORs. It is a difficult process, but it forces uh, accountability, transparency, and highlights issues and solutions in a way um, that is better for the organization in the long run. So we need to do this, but you need a leader to take you through that, that process. Uh, the other thing is that we haven't done basic things to even show that, that um, there, if this is a priority. So if the vehicles are the, some of the oldest in the state and the fleet, that means that we're just not investing um, in providing the services that we should provide. And what we see in this administration is a bumbling sort of leadership. Um, we even see it with uh, what happened uh, with the uh, child advocate where all of a sudden something happens, a job is posted, and um, it takes a number of days to say that was an accident. That is somebody who is out of touch and insensitive and is not in the details. And for something that is so critical, I would expect, or what you will get from me, is a hands-on governor who is involved when something is in crisis and demands that there is accountability and transparency, but also with proper leadership and support, because it is the only way to transform government. Mr. Brown. Well, unlike Governor McKee, I'll prioritize naming permanent directors to DHS and DCYF. I won't leave the agency's understaffed chronically and won't outsource the work to a for-profit corporation. Uh, DHS, back in February, said they needed 90 additional positions. Governor McKee said no. He left 100 vacancies unfilled. He's now trying to outsource the work of union experienced employees to Deloitte, the same for-profit corporation that caused the UHIP disaster. Uh, and now we've got people waiting in lines for hours to get the essential services that they need and working people just often can't do that. So as governor, I will fully staff the agencies. I will name permanent directors to, to the DC, DCYF and DHS. Uh, I will not outsource the work to a for-profit corporation and will open the field offices that have been closed. I will also increase funding and access to mental health services, counseling services, addiction services for parents and children so that we can shift some of the burden of this work uh, off of DCYF so it can play the role it is intended to play, which is, which is a solution of last resort for families. And lastly, I will work to make sure that parents have the resources that they need to care for their families raising the minimum wage to $19 an hour, enacting Medicare for all so everyone gets quality free health care in this state, expanding paid uh, family leave, and building tens of thousands of affordable homes and capping annual rent increases. All of this will put more money in the pockets of working people in this state. Thank you. Dr. Munoz. Yeah, the system is broken. And I know that many people operate within a broken system and we're all trying to do good within a broken system. This race is about having a governor that's willing to help mend the areas that we can mend and to completely build the new areas that we need. And when we talk about the child welfare system, everything that was already mentioned pretty much hints at the fact that whether, we're, whether it was Kachiri, Auman, Chafee, Governor Raimundo, everyone has been indifferent to the challenges that we're faced with today. And I will speak to Raimundo because I think McKee, his biggest failure is continuing the wrong approach that the Raimundo has taken in terms of privatizing our public health system and using that model across other departments as well. A good example, and I'm gonna come back to Child Welfare Services in a second, is DOH. You look at the line items, the budget, $65 million for 514 full-time employees. You look at the next line, $126 million for third-party service providers. That is privatization of healthcare. We are spending more of our public dollars on private companies. So we can't say that the system's not broken. We can't say that cronyism isn't driving Rhode Island politics, it is. And my, you know, when I, when I think of DCYF and all of the, the, the things that have happened, I mean, to even sit here and to, 
to, to have people that have served in office that have not made enough noise about this say that when they're governor, they will make more. It's concerning to me. We are sending youth out of state to get taken care of when they should be here. We have people sitting at, at Butler Hospital not seeing the, sun, the light of day, like if they're in prison. This is happening to kids, and it hasn't changed. In 2005, I worked at Arcadia Children's Home when I was an undergrad. I thought it was gonna be social work before medicine. The way they treated five to 12 year olds in that place was like if they were prisoners. They set them on a path to failure, and unfortunately, they stigmatize those children for the rest of their lives. It is about the money. It is about being creative, innovative, and transforming departments, but it's also about acknowledging that every administration over the last 20 years has failed our children, and we need to change the way we're doing things. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for your thoughtful answers to all of our questions here today. We're gonna to do a round of closing marks. You're each gonna have two minutes. And we're gonna start with the video of Governor McKee's remarks and then we will go in alphabetical order. The children's friend and right from the side for hosting this forum. I'm sorry I did not participate in person today due to COVID, but I'm happy to share some of what we've achieved over the last 18 months to make an immediate and long-term benefit to our children and our families. We've gone from one of the lowest vaccinated states in the country to the very best. And prioritizing teachers and staff in our vaccine rollout allowed us to reopen our schools safely and get children back in the classroom and parents back to work. That's helped us take the lead in the Northeast for reopening our economy, second in the country. We also have the lowest unemployment rate in our state's history. And we still have good paying jobs available to help Rhode Island support their family. My administration managed the largest budget surplus ever and we use that surplus to deliver relief for families by ending the contact and providing a $250 per child we bid. We know our children and families deserve our full attention, from education to early intervention to health care. That's why for the first time in decades, we expanded CCAP so more families, especially low-income and communities of color, have access to affordable early learning. We're strengthening the workforce by extending educated retention bonuses and child care startup grants and funding the Teach RI scholarship program. We're increasing rates to help early intervention providers recruit staff. And we've hired over 200 DCYF workers over the past year to strengthen our child care system. And I'm very proud to say, we finally expanded Medicaid coverage to all Rhode Island children and to all women up to 12 months postpartum, regardless of their immigration status. Supporting children, education, families is not politics to me. It's a priority reflected in my budget and my work over the last 18 months and the last two, two decades. So I'm thankful that I'm here today and I wish everybody the best of health. Mr. Brown. The people in power here have made draconian cuts to the critical services that our children need. And they have never had a hard time finding money to give massive tax breaks to the richest 1% in corporations. This year alone, Governor McKee just recently gave tens of millions of dollars to the corporate developers of the Superman building to build luxury apartments. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he cast the deciding vote to give tens of millions more public dollars to a corporate developer to build a soccer stadium in Pawtucket with a deal that we now know the government's own report said is gonna lose the state money. These are policy choices, they are decisions that the people running things have made to leave our children and our families without the critical health care and education and support services that they need. It doesn't need to be this way. We can change things, but no one person can do it alone. That's why I'm running with State Senator Cynthia Mendes for Lieutenant Governor and dozens of extraordinary candidates from across the state. Nurses, teachers, social workers, people who've been doing the work of caring for our communities for a long, long time. People including uh, Michael Niemeyer, who I mentioned earlier, who, who's used the early intervention program. Uh, so we're, we're in a campaign, I'm in a campaign, not just to elect a new governor, but to elect a whole new government. And when we do, we will enact a $19 an hour minimum wage and Medicare for all, so everyone can get quality, free health care, and expanded paid family leave so people can care for their loved ones. 
uh, and we will tax the rich so we can fund our schools and early childhood programs. Thank you very much. Ms. Folks. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I, I can't think of anything more important than making sure our kids have a great start. And when I think about this race, I think about how hard change really is. Uh, you know, I have led an enormous amount of change in my life. I started in a cubicle at CVS and worked my way up to run all of retail. Along the way, I ended up having 200,000 people working for me and an $80 billion budget. So I know how to get things done. I, ha I know how to make change happen. I was able to lead our decision to get out of cigarettes, which was a decision I was incredibly proud of. It's, a, it's an example of a very hard decision that we made together, we made as a team. And I know from my business experience how important it is to do things like you know, building a strong economy so we can invest in resources, putting money back in people's wallets and, and making this state affordable, whether it's housing or prescription drug prices, where we could be the first in the country to have zero co-pays. But I'm running against the status quo at some level. I'm running against the notion that, you know, what we have is good enough. It's Rhode Island. This is how it works in Rhode Island. And this is what career politicians have given us. A lot of platitudes, a lot of working with all of you, but not producing results. And that's what I'm all about. And I, I can't think of anything more important than our kids. In fact, if you look at the broader education platform in our state, only 33% of our kids pass their grade level reading tests and 20% in math. And I am the only candidate who has said, if I don't improve our kids' scores, I won't run again. And to me, that's what accountability is. You deserve to have a governor who will hold herself accountable for our children, for everyone in this state, and not just be part of the inside deal. And that's why it would be an honor for me to serve all of you, and I really look forward to it. So thank you. Secretary Corbea. So I want to thank David, children's friend, right from the start, everybody here um, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, it's, it's great to see these topics that I know we've had so many conversations about over the years finally get a gubernatorial forum. That's fantastic. And, and, and to see the caregiving economy be given the kind of attention that it really has always deserved and rarely ever been given. Um, you know, I know as a candidate mom how important this sector is. I've had intersections with it in my own life over my time here in Rhode Island. Uh, when my when one of my newborns was born, I, I got a, a visiting nurse that came by, and that was great because I didn't have family here, and so being able to be touched by this greater community made a difference in my life. My children went to home daycares. I know how important that service was, not just for my kids, for the kids that they were in in childcare with, and so as governor, I am looking forward to working with all of you on making sure that our economy is more equitable and just. And the way we do that is the way that you all know how to do it. The state employees that are dedicated to those kids know how to do it. And I know that what they're really craving for is a leader who will go beyond signing you know, bills or making press statements, but rather is actually willing to lead the office from the office of the governor and do the hard work. And we're going to take care of our kids, and I have committed to making sure that early child care and pre-K programs are available to all Rhode Island children by the time of my first term. I will also make sure that we have a state that's affordable to families by making sure that we address housing, education, climate change. All of these things are interconnected, and I know how to get it done. And, 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 you know, big ideas go to die in a bureaucracy that hasn't been transformed. We're going to do this transformation together, and I'm looking forward to it. Ms. Kalis. We didn't get here overnight. Um, and it would be great if every year was an election year because you'd get politicians to show up and make promises rather than disappearing after the election year. The reality is that the people who um, have been in government have failed families failed us in the education system and there should be some accountability for that. That's the only way that we get change. The other way that we get change is choosing something different. Um, I'm an outsider. I am not connected in decades to the system that has failed children and, and families. 
other than the fact that it's failed my family um, and it's failed Rhode Islanders. So I do believe that there should be consequences for inaction or failure. And the way that you do that is you elect somebody that's different. You elect someone who's not beholden and you believe in the two-party system. The two-party system forces change, it forces ideas, and that is what you will get if you elect a Republican as governor. That's what you will get with me. The other thing is that I am in the midst of dealing with child care and education as a mom and as a small business owner. I am living it. I, I might have had my children in the back row today if something happened in that weird gap between summer camp and, and school starting and somebody's sick. And you'd say, oh, that's so cute. And I would say, no, you, you, I mean, it may be cute, but you don't understand. That's because I don't have child care, right? So I am living it. It is very fresh. Some of these issues, they are very personal to me. And I think that that matters in leadership because you're able to assess whether a solution to a problem will really work and if it's good enough. And I think it really uh, does uh, make a difference. I'd also like to highlight something else. I'm trying to be respectful of time. Um, but I want to say that um, empathizing with how much child care matters, and we all love child care, and I hear a lot of that. That's called talking points in politics. They're trying to train me to do it, and I'm not uh, very trainable, apparently. Those are talking points. What, now, what you should expect and listen for is actual solutions. And so what I gave today, and, I, and we really look at policy, and what you look for in policy solutions, so specific policy solutions to address your issues. So I suggest that you look back at this forum and look at who actually dis, uh, stated solutions to policy issues rather than saying how much education matters and how much childcare matters, but look at the people who actually gave you concrete solutions. And I think that evaluate those ideas instead of feeling good about talking points. Dr. Munoz. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you all today. Um, you know, when you've grown up in Rhode Island and you've gone through, grown up in the urban core, you, you look back and you go through a phase of imposter syndrome. You wonder if uh, you're in the spaces and you don't belong there and maybe, maybe you're being too aggressive and then you realize you're being just aggressive enough and maybe you should be a little more, um, especially as it relates to policies. <laughs> We live in a country that printed $1.6 trillion and gave it to corporations who gave it to the top 1%. This is the country we live in. We live in a state where we've had hundreds of millions of dollars that were not deployed for rent relief because we work with a nonprofit or pseudo, uh, you know, Rhode Island Housing, and they sourced out to a company in Utah that had protocols in place that didn't address technology literacy, that didn't have an understanding of equity. We have an administration that could not even define equity in a press conference. Leadership matters, but the lens through which we look at these problems matters more than anything else because that's the lens through which we develop solutions. You know, I'm running for governor because I do not believe that there is any insider that's ever been governor of Rhode Island that doesn't wake up in the morning and think, self-preservation. There is no corporate executive that's ever been governor of Rhode Island that didn't wake up in the morning and think, how do I help my corporate donors? You know, we need to focus on people. And the way we do that is we have to be aggressive with supplemental wage programs. If we have $1.1 billion, we can't say that 1,600 is enough. We need to talk in the range of what is it like to have a $100 million or more supplemental wage program to get people towards a livable wage? What is it like to create comprehensive community health hubs across our five counties that can house the needed services that are not being adequately addressed right now, from addiction to mental health services, as well as some of the child services, child welfare services? How do we transform our education funding formula so that it's not just something in a constitution that people are going to ignore anyway and ensure that it's actually money, increasing the money that the state is contributing to cities and towns by no less than 25%, but we'll still, we'll, we'll still need an equity assessment to ensure that we have the right number. I am running for governor because in the words of Bobby Kennedy, when there is plenty, poverty is evil, and no one else wants to call that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, really, for your time this morning. There are a few important election dates. We can't hammer this home enough. I know so many people so active in politics here know these dates. But for those of you at home, today is the last day for a mail ballot application for the primary. So you can go online to vote.sos.ri.gov today if you want to apply for one. The primary is Tuesday, September 13th. And if you haven't registered yet, but you want to vote in the general, you must register online by October 9th. The mail ballot application deadline is October 18th. And finally, the general election is Tuesday, November 8th. The uh, place to register online is vote.sos.ri.gov. We thank you all so much for your time and attention. This really was an amazing experience to 
highlight these issues that matter so much for our future and for our children here in Rhode Island. So thank you candidates and thank you Children's Friend and Right From The Start campaign. Thank you everybody.